Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and the Illinois least weasel in the seat next to me is Ellen. I'm going to pretend that you said the Illinois least weasley. The weasels are adorable. And it's better than being a ferret, though ferrets are cute too. Same family. Maybe that's why Draco didn't like being turned into one. It was basically like becoming part of the Weasley family. Oh, the horror. Heaven forbid. Mm -hmm. I think the Weasleys would be more upset by that. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) But let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 21, The Eye of the Snake and the corresponding film scenes. Neville finally starts showing his potential. Everyone is sad to not have another DA meeting until the new year, but stoked to be umbrage free for three weeks. Cho gets wet, but it's less porno and more Lifetime movie. The jury is still out as to whether Ron is more afraid of spiders or feelings. Hermione has had it with the testosterone-fueled dumbassery surrounding her. Harry has a dream that he's a snake, but for once, that's not an innuendo. And McGonagall has learned that when it comes to Harry Potter, it's really best to not question things. During episode 155, Bangin' Business, our Potter pondering was, do you think Cho actually really likes Harry, or are her feelings just more of a trauma response? Hey guys, Jackson here with my Potter pondering for this week. So, Cho's feelings for Harry. This is a tough one. I kind of feel like it's a mix of both. Like, she does genuinely like him, but mixed in is that trauma response to and her feelings for Cedric as well. So, look, her and Harry were never good for each other due to the trauma. Yeah, they did like each other. She genuinely did like him. But the trauma just made it too hard for them to ever be a good couple. That's what I think anyway. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. Do I think that Cho Chang was really feeling Harry or was it just a trauma response? I think it was a little combination of both. I feel like it was like a little tiny, you know, spark since Goblet of Fire. And that's probably the only reason why I believe that it might be a little bit more than just that. But definitely, if at all, it's like, you know... 80-20, 80% trauma response and 20% feelings, especially after they had that little dusty date and she was just all in her feelings. Uh, Definitely, she was trying to have one of them toxic bonds with my boy. That would have been a nice little fucked up relationship right there. I think if they would have got together, Harry definitely would have been too distracted from his real life focusing on that girl and would have fucked up the whole order of the Phoenix. But I'm just saying. I'm just saying. (laughs) Definitely, though, trauma response, but not that she didn't have any feelings for him, you know? Just think about it. If you're going to trauma bond with somebody, why are you still there? You got to be feeling something. (laughs) Hey, Ellen. Hey, Katie. It's me, Quincy. Listen, I've always had a weird feeling about Cho and Harry, right? I feel like... Cho only really wanted to be with Harry because she wanted to feel closer to Cedric because Harry was the last person to see Cedric alive. I don't think she actually felt any type of affection towards him. Maybe she did in the past, but I feel she almost kind of blamed him for Cedric in a way, but in a sense also got off on that, if that makes sense. I think it was a trauma response. She was trying to trauma bond with him. Oh, I miss Cedric. Oh, I miss Cedric. Oh, let's fuck or whatever. It really didn't make any sense to me. But hey, whatever tickles your pickle, Harry. 
go ahead after your dead friend's girlfriend. Also, were they even really friends? I'm rambling now, but y'all get the point. She ain't really want him. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Megan calling in with my Potter pondering. I think, yes, Cho genuinely likes Harry. I think that Hermione did a great job at explaining the complex emotions that Cho must be feeling right now. And I do think that Cho genuinely does like Harry because she liked him before Cedric died. Because she was genuinely sorry when she couldn't go to the ball with him last year. Thanks. Happy Halloween, Ellen and Katie. This is Tom. I called to go over my Potter pondering. And, well, when I read the book, I always assumed that she had feelings for Harry, but after your episode, I kind of get the feeling that it is a trauma response. I'd like to think that it's a mixture of both, but I'm fairly certain that, you know, she's just trying to work out what happened to her boyfriend. Bye. Thank you for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what are the names of the witch and wizard in the portraits that Dumbledore sends to raise the alarm about Mr. Weasley's attack? Dumbledore calls the wizard Everard and the witch Dillis. Congratulations goes to Megan Slater. Woohoo! Eight weeks in a row. I wonder if she can keep this going. Oh my gosh, we shall see. For now, let's just dive into the first half of chapter 22. St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries and the sort of corresponding film scenes? Sort of. Mm -hmm. Chapter 22, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, Part 1. Harry is so relieved that Professor McGonagall is taking him seriously that he immediately jumps out of bed, pulls on his dressing gown, and puts on his glasses. McGonagall tells Ron that he should go with them too, and the two boys follow her out of Gryffindor Tower and towards Dumbledore's office. Harry thinks about Mr. Weasley, bleeding, and just wants to run and yell for Dumbledore. He tries to not think of the fangs that bit him as his fangs, but worries that they might have been poisonous. They pass Mrs. Norris, who slinks away when McGonagall tells her to shoo, and after a few minutes, they reach the stone gargoyle guarding Dumbledore's office. It springs to life and leaps aside after McGonagall says, Fizzing Wisby, and the three of them step onto the moving staircase up to the polished oak door with a brass griffin-shaped knocker. Though it is after midnight, they can hear a babble of voices through the door, which cease as soon as McGonagall knocks. The door opens itself and McGonagall leads Harry and Ron into the half-dark room, where the portraits are all snoozing in their frames and Fox the Phoenix is dozing on his perch. Dumbledore is sitting in his high-backed chair and greets McGonagall as he notices who is with her. She begins to explain that Potter had a nightmare, but stops when Harry interrupts to insist that it wasn't a nightmare. She tells him to let Dumbledore know about it, and Harry explains that he had been asleep, but what he saw wasn't an ordinary dream, it was real. He tells the headmaster that he saw Mr. Weasley get attacked by a giant snake. Dumbledore doesn't quite look at Harry as he calmly asks him how he saw it, and Harry angrily responds that he doesn't know. In the same calm voice, Dumbledore explains that he means to ask how he was positioned during the attack, beside the victim or looking down from above. The question makes Harry feel like Dumbledore already knew the answer when he explains that he was the snake and saw it from the snake's point of view. Dumbledore then looks at Ron as he asks Harry if Arthur is seriously injured, and Harry gives an extremely annoyed yes. He doesn't understand why everyone seems so slow on the uptake or why Dumbledore won't even look at him. In response, Dumbledore abruptly stands, then sharply calls to Everard and Dillis. The two portraits open their eyes immediately, and Dumbledore asks if they were listening before giving them a description of Mr. Weasley and instructing them to raise the alarm, telling Everard to make sure he's found by the right people. They disappear out of their frames, and Dumbledore explains that they were two of Hogwarts' most celebrated heads and have portraits hanging in other wizarding institutions, which allows them to freely move between them and let them know what is happening elsewhere. 
Harry protests that Mr. Weasley could be anywhere, but Dumbledore just ignores him and asks them all to sit down, requesting Professor McGonagall to draw up extra chairs. He then wakes Fox and tells the Phoenix they will need a warning, and in a flash, the bird is gone. Dumbledore picks up a silver instrument and carries it to his desk, tapping it gently with his wand and watching the pale green smoke that emits from a tiny silver tube at the top, forming a serpent's head. He mumbles to himself about something in essence divided, and Harry has no idea what he's talking about, though the smoke snake splits into two before Dumbledore looks satisfied and taps the device again with his wand to cause the smoke to vanish. He puts it back where he got it from, and before Harry can ask any questions, the portrait of the wizard Dumbledore called Everard returns and lets them know that they found him and he isn't looking good, all covered in blood. Dumbledore figures that Dillis will have seen him arrive at St. Mungo's, and her portrait returns to confirm this, also sharing that he looks bad. Dumbledore thanks her and turns back to Minerva, asking her to wake the other Weasley children. She agrees, but asks about Molly before she leaves. The headmaster says that will be a job for Fox when he's finished keeping watch, but she may already know because of her clock. As Harry thinks about the clock and Mrs. Weasley's boggart turning into Mr. Weasley's lifeless body, Dumbledore begins rummaging in a cupboard behind him and Ron. He pulls out a blackened old kettle and taps it with his wand while saying Portis, before heading to another portrait of a wizard pretending to sleep, painted in Slytherin robes. Dumbledore has to call out his name, Phineas, several times, the other portraits even joining in until he can no longer pretend to be asleep and gives a theatrical jerk before opening his eyes. He asks if someone called, and Dumbledore instructs him to visit his other portrait with another message. Phineas initially refuses, but the other portraits shame him until he agrees. Dumbledore tells the portrait to let Sirius know that Arthur Weasley has been gravely injured and his wife, children, and Harry Potter will be arriving at his house shortly. Harry thinks the voice sounds familiar and realizes that he had heard it coming from the apparently empty frame in his bedroom at Grimmauld Place as Phineas repeats the message and disappears out the side of the frame. At this point, Fred, George, and Ginny return with Professor McGonagall, all still in their nightclothes and looking disheveled and shocked. Ginny asks Harry what happened, but Dumbledore is the one who answers, explaining that their father has been injured in the course of his work for the Order of the Phoenix and has been taken to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. He tells them that he's going to send them to Sirius's house, which is much closer to the hospital than the burrow, and their mother will meet them there. Fred wonders if they will use flu powder, but Dumbledore explains that it isn't safe, so they will be using a port key. He gestures to the black kettle on his desk and says that they are just waiting for the all-clear from Phineas Nigellus before he sends them. With a flash of flame, a single golden feather floats down to the floor, and Dumbledore says that she must know they're out of bed, and directs Minerva to head her off. As she sweeps away, Phineas returns and reports that his great-great-grandson will be delighted. Dumbledore calls for Harry and the Weasleys to come to the kettle quickly, and has them all touch some part of it before he counts to three. During this, Dumbledore's eyes finally meet Harry's, and the latter is struck with a terrifying and unwanted powerful surge of hatred as he longs to strike and bite the man before him. But on three, he feels that jerk behind his navel and the ground vanish beneath him as he bangs into the others around him, swept away in a rush of wind and swirling colors. When he hits the ground, he can hear a voice commenting on the return of the blood traitors, wondering if it's true their father is dying, then hears a second voice roar to the first to get out. Harry scrambles to his feet to find them in the basement kitchen of number 12 Grimmauld Place. Creature is slinking out the door as Sirius is hurrying towards them, wondering what's going on. Fred tells him to ask Harry and George agrees, saying he wants to hear it for himself. Harry explains that he had a sort of vision and tells them what he saw, adjusting the story a little so it sounds like he was watching from the sidelines rather than through the snake's eyes. Ron gives him a quick look but doesn't say anything as Harry finishes the story. Fred asks if their mom is there yet, and Sirius says that Dumbledore is probably letting her know now. Ginny insists that they all need to go to St. Mungo's, asking Sirius if they can borrow cloaks, but he informs them that they can't go tearing off to St. Mungo's before they're even supposed to know their dad has been attacked, before the hospital has even informed his wife. 
George doesn't think that matters, but Sirius tries to explain that they can't draw attention to the fact that Harry is having visions of things that are happening hundreds of miles away. Fred, George, and Ginny don't really care, only concerned that their dad might be dying, and after some arguing, Sirius manages to calmly tell them that he knows it's hard, but they have to stay put, at least until they hear from their mother. Fred and George don't look happy with this, but Ginny sinks into the nearest chair. Ron and Harry exchange a look and both sit down as well. The twins glare at Sirius, but also sit, and Sirius summons Butterbeer from the pantry, and they all drink and wait. Harry is really only drinking for something to do with his hands, as his brain obsesses over whether or not he was the one who attacked Mr. Weasley, and that feeling of wanting to attack Dumbledore. After a while, in another burst of flame, a scroll of parchment and a golden feather lands on the table. Sirius grabs it and says it must be from their mother before handing it to George, who rips it open and reads aloud. Dad is still alive. I'm setting out for St. Mungo's now. Stay where you are. I will send news as soon as I can. Mum. They all realize that the letter makes it sound like their dad is hovering somewhere between life and death and falls silent. Sirius half-heartedly suggests they go to bed, but the look on the Weasleys' faces are answer enough, and they all remain in the kitchen for the longest night Harry can ever remember. The movie section starts up in Dumbledore's office, where Professor McGonagall and the Weasley children watch as Harry explains to the headmaster what he saw in his dream. With his back to Harry, Dumbledore asks him if he was standing next to the victim or looking down at the scene. Harry tells him neither and starts to explain how he saw it happen, but interrupts himself to ask Dumbledore to tell him what is happening. Instead, Dumbledore addresses a portrait as Everard and asks him to make sure Arthur Weasley is found by the right people. Harry tries to speak to him again, but he continues to ignore him and instead asks another portrait, Phineas, to go to his portrait at Grimmauld Place and let them know that Arthur Weasley is gravely injured and his children will be arriving there soon by portkey. Harry watches, trying to take big, steadying breaths, and Everard returns, letting Dumbledore know that they found him and think he will be all right, also adding on that the Dark Lord failed to acquire it. Dumbledore is relieved by this and begins to mumble to himself, but is cut off when Harry yells for him to look at him. He finally looks at him and Harry pants as he again asks his headmaster what is happening to him. They are interrupted by the arrival of Professor Snape, who asks that the headmaster wish to see him. Dumbledore tells Severus that it can't wait until morning or they will all be vulnerable. Some dings. Yeah, some, sure. A lot more, that's not how it happened in the book. No. <laughs> also, that's not how it happened in the movie. Mostly, that's not how it happened in the book. I'm just saying. Goes both ways, Ellen. Yeah, this is another one of those where there's just a lot that didn't make it into the movie, even though it was in the book. Mm -hmm. And then what they did include in the movie was kind of different from the book. Also kind of random. Like, seemingly. Like, yeah. Just... But hey, it gives us stuff to talk about. Sure. Welcome to it. I think we kind of mentioned this last week that the movie just completely streamlined out this section. Because we see the whole transition from Gryffindor Tower to Dumbledore's office. Yeah. Yeah. Which we do not in the movie. No, it just kind of jumps right to it. You get like yeah. the brief, hey, we're in the corridor. Mm -hmm. Jump to this. But we actually follow them over the river and through the woods. Uh -huh. or, to Dumbledore's office we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, you know, through the corridors and up the stairs and yeah. past Mrs. Norris. And <laughs> they get to the stone gargoyle that guards Dumbledore's office, and mm -hmm. the password is Fizzing Wisby because he loves making his passwords sweets. Right. But that makes the gargoyle jump aside, and they get on the moving staircase, which, you know, the spiral escalator is what I'm going to call it. Yeah. And ride their way up to that polished oak door with the brass griffin-shaped knocker that was not in the movie. <laughs> nice knocker. Yeah. <laughs> Dumbledore's got some good knockers. He really does. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Moving on. They get up to the door, and even though it's late, it's after midnight, it sounds like Dumbledore's throwing a party. There was just this babble of voices. I mean, maybe he was. Maybe he was. But the moment that McGonagall knocks, falls silent. Mm-hmm. And then the door opens itself, and they walk in, and it's just a half-dark room 
sleeping portraits on the wall, Dumbledore at his desk, sleeping fox behind him, the silver instruments, which are normally like whirring and emitting noises and lights and sure. smoke and stuff are all silent. Yeah, that's not suspicious at all. No evidence of there being any <laughs> other people there in nope. any way, shape or form. And Dumbledore's just like, oh, McGonagall, it's you, and looks at Harry, and you, except he doesn't actually look at Harry, because he just won't look at Harry. Oh, yeah, he's zero eye contact. So McGonagall begins to explain that Potter had a nightmare, Mm -hmm. and Harry's just like, it wasn't a nightmare. Like, stop calling it that. It wasn't. I saw it. It real. It happened. And so she says, then you tell him. Yeah. Like, I can, whatever, just you tell him about it. So Harry explains, he's like, well, I was asleep. Okay. But this was not a dream. It was different than a dream. It was real. It felt real. Anyway, long story short, Mr. Weasley has been attacked by a giant snake. We need to help him like yesterday. That escalated quickly. Yeah. (laughs) And Dumbledore, still refusing to look at Harry, won't make eye contact with him. Mm Mm-hmm. Probably looks at, I imagine, like the top of his head or something or like over his head because he looks in his general direction, just clearly not at him. Yeah. And says, how did you see this? And Harry's just like, I don't fucking know. Why are you asking me this? Do you not get this? Mr. Weasley has been attacked. He is in grave danger. I'm reminded of my favorite quote from Empire Records. Who knows where thoughts come from? They just appear. (laughs) (laughs) And Dumbledore very calmly because he's Dumbledore and this is the book Mm -hmm. says no 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 you misunderstood what I was asking what I mean is in what position were you during the attack were you standing next to the victim were you watching it from above looking down where were you oh well that's a totally different yes question and Harry was just like he knows (laughs) But explains that he was the snake. He saw it through the snake's eyes. Yeah. Just to add insult to Arthur's injury. Mm -hmm. Dumbledore then looks at Ron as he asks Harry if Arthur is seriously injured. Did you just want to see the poor Ginger's heartbreak or something? I don't know. I mean, it was just somewhere else to look. And Harry is super annoyed at this point. He's just like, yes, he's seriously injured. Why do you think I'm here? (laughs) If I just thought it was a dream and he was fine, do you think I would be here? This is not like, yes, he's seriously injured. And why won't you look at me? So he's annoyed. Are you okay, Ellen? I got a little bit high pitched there. (laughs) My God. I was really feeling it for Harry in that moment. Clean my ears out for a sec. Wow. (laughs) My glass of water is broken, Ellen. Damn it. (laughs) But anyway, in Harry's mind, everyone just seems really slow on the uptake here. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he's annoyed that Dumbledore won't look at him. I mean, I would be too. Yeah, this has become an ongoing thing. Yeah. And I'm sure that this does nothing to lessen that annoyance because instead of actually answering harry or asking any other questions or looking at him he just stands up and turns towards the portraits calling out for everard and dillis which was our trivia question sure was the two sleeping i do that with air quotes the two sleeping portraits immediately open their eyes because clearly they were faking it and harry's just like oh that's (laughs) who was talking that's what was going on right. you weren't having a giant party well you were it was a paint party a portrait party yeah there we go dumbledore asks them if they were listening in and they were like naturally right it's kind of what we do <laughs> yeah and then he gives them a description of mr weasley red hair hand me down robes sure yeah. <laughs> the gist <laughs> and instructs them to raise the alarm telling everard specifically make sure he's found by the right people Which is kind of always a good rule of thumb. Yeah, you'd think. (laughs) They disappear out of their frame, and Harry notices that it's not like where they turn back and walk in and appear in another neighboring frame. They just disappear. Yeah, they just go the fuck away. Yeah, and Dumbledore explains that these were two of Hogwarts' most celebrated heads, which means they were popular enough and famous enough to have portraits in other wizarding institutions. Yeah, multiple so portraits. we're starting to get a little bit of a glimpse here of Dumbledore's spies. At yeah. least some of them. I just love that that was a thing. Mm-hmm. And it turns into such an important thing later on. Yeah. And this was like really the first time that we're seeing that, oh, it's not just like neighboring portrait. Like, 
you can go to your own other portraits. Yeah. Because that gives them the freedom. They can go to any portrait within Hogwarts. Mm hmm. And they can go to their other portraits in the other wizarding institutions, which we will end up learning what they are. And they can go into any of the portraits in those institutions as well. So these are some handy dandy little ear spies for right? Dumbledore. Seriously. And I love getting that little glimpse of how he gets information that he gets. Because mm -hmm. he is very well informed. Yeah. I mean, and it's perfect because you forget the pictures that are on the mm -hmm. walls. I mean, you totally don't think about there's a portrait of this person in the ministry. There's a portrait of this person in fucking Umbridge's office, whatever. Like if there is a painting in Umbridge's office, Everard could get in it and hide and just listen to the bitch. Exactly. Exactly. I wonder if the plates count. <laughs> He's just hanging in there with the kittens. Yeah, they're just... not paintings necessarily. But they're magic. But I wonder. Hmm. Photographs as well. Chocolate frog cards. Well, I mean, in the first, he says, Ron says, you can't expect Dumbledore to hang around all day. Yeah. I just assumed that was to other chocolate frog cards, but. Yeah, but why would. It could be chocolate frog cards and potential portraits. Yeah. If they all become magically connected. But then Dumbledore was also still alive then, so your portrait after death might be different than just any portrait just, of you. Yeah. The portrait thing, I love it, but there's so many open-ended questions about it. That's kind of just magic in general. Yeah. Well, it's that's fun. true. Fair point. Anyway, they can move freely between their portraits and listen in on other conversations that are happening elsewhere. Yep. And Harry's just like, but they could be anywhere. And this is just so cute to me because Harry... Harry, 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 do you honestly think that Dumbledore doesn't know exactly where Mr. Weasley is? Why in the world would he have randomly been somewhere where a snake could attack him? Silly Harry. Come on, Harry. You're not the only one who has an eye on the inside, if you will. Mm -hmm. But this is why he's not Ravenclaw. Yeah. And Dumbledore, par for the course in this, just ignores him. Mm-hmm. It feels very pointed at this moment. Like, he's specifically ignoring things Harry says. Yeah, and I think that he's doing everything he can. I think he's afraid that if he does start answering these questions, he'll get sucked into a conversation and end up looking at him. Yeah, and he doesn't want to look at him. So I think it is pointed. Again, it's it, kind of passive aggressive almost. It's something. I mean, yeah. He tells them all to sit down, asks Professor McGonagall to draw up some chairs, which she doesn't do as dramatically as he does, since he literally draws up chairs. <laughs> right. Uses his wand to draw the chair in the air. McDonald's was just like, oh, you're such a queen. Like <laughs> Chairs. She doesn't do squashy purple armchairs like he does either. No. They just get chairs. McGonagall's a meat and potatoes kind of gal. Right. She's just, fuck it, just Function sit. over flourish. Yeah. <laughs> just sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up. <laughs> but while they all sit, Dumbledore goes and wakes up Fox. Says that they will need a warning. Doesn't have to say what they'll need a warning for. Just that they'll need a warning and the bird is gone. Sure. From there, he picks up one of those silver instruments that was sitting so nice and quietly, carries it to his desk, taps on it with his wand, and it starts doing its thing. And this pale green smoke starts coming out of the top of it. It's like a little silver tube at the top. Okay. And then forms itself into a serpent. So... It's a hookah, right? Something. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> it's like a little mini bomb. I'm actually kind of bummed that we didn't get to hear. Yeah. It's... I really wonder what it is. Harry thinks that it might just be confirming his story. And before he can ask Dumbledore what it is, Dumbledore is just totally caught up in what he's looking at and just mumbling to himself. And he says something about like, yes, yes, but in essence divided. Like, oh, that's a totally normal thing to say. Sure. Right. And then yeah. the smoke snake splits into two snakes. And then Dumbledore taps it again and causes everything to vanish. And the silver instrument basically turns itself off. I mean, it did its thing. Yeah. I, I guess. And I'm really curious about it because. Right. What was it telling him? That was some weird ass tea leaf shit. Yeah. That's what it felt like right there. We so, were just like looking at it like, oh, yes, of course. In essence, divided. Yes. Talking about divided, so maybe this is one of the things that's giving him a clue about the soul and maybe the control that he has over that snake. Yeah. But then splitting into two snakes, like I would just really like to see if anybody else has some theories about what this was and what it was telling him and what it means. Yeah. 
I'm very open to any and all theories there because I just have none. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. And we should make up a name for the device as well. Before Harry can actually ask any of his questions that he wants to about this device and what it showed him and what Dumbledore is thinking or why he won't look at him. La 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 la. Sure. Everard returns. Uh huh. And lets Dumbledore know that they found him. He had to shout to get some attention of the right people and explain what happened. And they didn't quite believe him at first, but eventually they went to go check and they found him and he saw them carrying him back yeah. up and he was just like he does not look good he is covered in blood mm -hmm. and ron just goes completely white at this point and dumbledore says then dillis probably has seen him arrive at saint mungo's and she returns at this moment to confirm that and then also says he looks really bad so somehow ron gets even whiter understandably yeah understandably because i mean that's your dad right that would scare the shit out of me. And you're not there with him. You don't know what's going on. You're just hearing these descriptions from portraits that you didn't know, even know. After your best friend tells you that he saw it happen in a dream from the snake's eyes that did it. Yeah. There's a lot of shit going on right now. There is very little blood up to his brain. Yes, very little. All the blood is in his ass at this point. There's just nowhere else for it to go. Dumbledore thinks the portraits turns back to Minerva and says, can you go wake the other Weasley children? Which she agrees to, but as she starts to leave, she turns back and says, what about Molly? Mm -hmm. Dumbledore says, that'll be a job for Fox when he's finished keeping watch. She may already know, though, that excellent clock of hers. Yeah. And Harry remembers the clock that was in the kitchen that had all of the different places that they could be and the hands on it and is just freaking out because he's now worried that... Mr. Weasley's hand is pointing at mortal peril. Sure. And I imagine that point on the clock must, like, emit kind of an alarm. Yeah, that would be reasonable. That's how it goes in my head, at least. I think that makes a lot of sense because Harry thinks that she might still be sleeping and wouldn't know. Yeah. But then he also thinks about her Boggart and how it turned into the lifeless form of all of her loved ones. Mm hmm And thinks that there's just a really good chance that whenever Mr. Weasley's doing something from the order, she might just be staring at that damn clock. I would be. Yeah. I don't know that I would be able to sleep if I knew my husband was doing something potentially dangerous. For sure. Or anybody. My kids, my husband, mm -hmm. whatever. When my daughter was a baby, we had a little thing that went on her foot that tracked her pulse. And if the pulse went too low or her oxygen level went too low, it would set off an alarm in our bedroom because I was so nervous about something happening to her in her sleep. So we specifically got this thing. And that was the only way I was able to sleep. Just yeah. knowing like, okay, if you something need something happens, for that peace of mind. Exactly. So I can totally see Molly like bewitching the clock to where if it was in like danger or mortal peril or whatever, a giant alarm just going off. That just makes the most sense to me. I like that. Mm -hmm. New head cannon. Yep. But while Harry's going over all this in his head, Dumbledore is rummaging in a cupboard behind him and Ron mm -hmm. until he pulls out a blackened old tea kettle, which he turns into a port key by saying portus. And I kind of like to believe it was just like, what do I not care about anymore? Yeah, this will do. <laughs> <laughs> and then he leaves that on his desk and heads to another portrait of another wizard that is pretending to sleep this one's wearing Slytherin robes. I mean, he looks rather dashing, <laughs> if I do say so. And what's hilarious about this is he is being very dramatic about being asleep. What? And Dumbledore is like, Phineas, Phineas, doesn't wake up. The other portraits start joining in and they're all going, Phineas, Phineas, Phineas. <laughs> and finally, it's loud enough that he can't pretend like he's sleeping anymore. And he does this very theatrical jerk and dramatically opens his eyes and just goes, did someone call? I imagine it being a little Lockhearty, just like, huh, huh, oh, oh, I am awake. Did, did someone say my name? Was someone summoning me? Yeah. Um, yes. Dumbledore says that he needs him to go visit his other portrait with another message. And Phineas is just like, I'm so tired, not tonight. <laughs> and then all of the other portraits just start yelling at him. Some of them even start threatening him. I wonder why they didn't just go into his portrait. Oh, they were about to. Yeah. I'm sure they have some level of respect for one another. Meh. That's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, I mean, threatening him, shaming him for not doing their duty yeah because as former headmasters and headmistresses 
their portraits are bound to support the current one. Yeah, of course. So they're like, you must do this. And he's like, fine, fine. And Harry's just like, his voice sounds so familiar. Like, I know this guy. I know this voice. Why would I know this voice? And Phineas is just like, what do you need me to do? And he's just like, I need you to go to your other portrait. Let Sirius know that Arthur Weasley has been gravely injured and his wife, children, and Harry Potter will be arriving at his house shortly. Because fuck Hermione. (laughs) Hermione is going skiing with her family at this point. I know, but still. This makes Harry realize that he heard the voice in Grim Old Place. It was actually coming from the what always appeared to be empty, but the portrait in his bedroom with Ron at Grim Old Place. Mm -hmm. And this is furthermore confirmed when Phineas just says, he's probably destroyed that portrait by now. And Dumbledore's just like, serious nose not to destroy that portrait. Right. I'm sure he's been tempted. Yeah. No doubt, but he knows better. Yeah. Yeah. Dumbledore's like, yeah, he's not going to do that. Go fucking tell him. And he asks if he understood the message, if it's all clear. And Phineas repeats it to him. Like a three-year-old. Yeah. (laughs) What did I just tell you to do? And then he disappears out the side of his portrait as well. And now Professor McGonagall comes back and she's got Fred, George, and Ginny with her. Mm -hmm. They're all still wearing their night clothes too because you know she did not give them time to dress. Doesn't even sound like she let him put on any kind of dressing gown. It was just a let's go. Yeah. (laughs) And they look shocked and scared and they're like what is going on right now and i don't even know if they know much of anything at all i think it's just you need to come to dumbledore's office right now yeah something's happened you need to get the fuck up and come with me we gotta go bitch yeah light that fire under your ass kids let's go let's go let's go this is basically where the movie comes in but it is really a severe consolidation of the book information into this yeah We join the movie in Dumbledore's office. McGonagall and a pack of Weasleys look on as Dumbledore grills Harry about his dream slash vision while making absolutely zero eye contact. So ding. We got a ding. Sure. I mean, Fred, George, and Ginny weren't really there for this part of it in the book, but. Yeah. But like you said, consolidated. Yeah. And the whole Dumbledore making zero eye contact. Yeah. That was definitely a ding. Yeah. Also a ding was he asks Harry about his point of view during the dream. Like, was he watching from above, or was he Arthur, or what, you know, Standing right next to him. Yeah. And Harry's just like, yes, because this is the movie, of course. (laughs) And really, that's pretty much what we got, was all the different angles. But before going into details, he starts to get desperate, wanting to know, like, what the actual fuck just happened. Understandably. Yeah. So it's just kind of, but, uh, what the fuck? Yeah. (laughs) However, Dumbledore just continues his passive-aggressive silent treatment and doesn't answer, instead choosing to confer with the artwork in his office, who he refers to as Everard. I'm going to give this a half ding. Yeah. It's a di. Yeah. No Dillis, but we got an Everard at least, so Mm -hmm. sure. He tells his oil-based homie to peace out and let SWAT know that shit has just gone down and they need an evac team in stat. The word right for people. word, what he said, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I may or may not have paraphrased that a little bit, but... Just yeah, a little. Just a smidge. Yeah, so definitely we are ding adjacent. There are sure. even some that are direct dings at this point. Mm-hmm. Who is present at the point that this is happening? A little different, but... Definitely. In general, quite similar. Sure. What we don't get in the movie, but in the book, is... Ginny having that opportunity to just look at Harry and be like, what happened? Yeah. And it's actually Dumbledore who answers it because book Dumbledore explains some shit. What? Some. We don't do that in the movie. He tells her that their father's been injured doing work for the Order of the Phoenix. He's been taken to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. And that he's planning on sending them to Sirius's house because they'll be closer to the hospital there than they would if they went to the borough. Sure. And that their mother is going to meet them there. Mm -hmm. General game plan. Yeah. None of that is in the movie, though. That is what ends up happening. Yeah. Essentially. Definitely not there, though. (laughs) Yeah. Fred asks if they're going to use flu powder to get there. But as it's being monitored, Dumbledore's just like, can't do that. (laughs) I made an illegal port key for you. I find it funny that the spell to make a port key is that simple. (laughs) 
I think it's that simple for Dumbledore. Okay, yeah. that's. I think the power that goes behind making it is probably not that simple. Probably. Okay, yeah. I'll give you that. I mean, Hermione might be able to do it too, but I can see what you're saying. Yeah, at this point, she probably gets the theory of it. Yeah. And they can't monitor port keys, which is probably why they're so heavily restricted. Yeah. I imagine that it would not look good for Dumbledore had they caught him doing that. No. And they mentioned something later on in the book mm-hmm. about it, but we'll get there. Anyway, he points to the black kettle that he had turned into the port key and says that he's just waiting to hear back from Phineas Nigellus to make sure that the coast is clear before he sends them on their way. Mm-hmm. During this, there's this flash of flame and a single gold feather just floats gently to the ground. And Dumbledore says, she must know that you're out of bed. And he sends Professor McGonagall off to distract her. Mm -hmm. Tell her any story. And obviously, though he never says who she is, we all know. We know. That is Pepto Bitch Mall. Yeah. How she figured out that they're out of bed, I'm very curious. Probably Mrs. Norris. Mrs. Norris. Again, maybe she's got a clock like Molly does for like her most wanted students. Maybe. I don't know. She's got something. I'm willing to bet it was Mrs. Norris reporting, though. More than likely, sure. Anyway, McGonagall goes to stop her. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she enjoyed that job, too. Just getting to make up a story. Oh, yeah. She's probably got them, like, all filed away in her head. Like, different excuses for shit. I would love to know what she told her, too. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Bonus Potter pondering. Yeah. We're not going to put it on TikTok, but if you happen to catch this yeah, and want to include it in your recording for us, let us know. We want to know what story you think McGonagall gave yeah. Umbridge. Yeah, give us the scene as you see it play out. Yeah. And action. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Phineas returns, reports that his great-great-grandson will be delighted to have them join him, expresses his disbelief in that, but also comments that he enjoys very strange company. He's so extra, Phineas is. Yeah, Phineas is definitely extra. (laughs) So now that Dumbledore knows the coast is clear, he calls for Harry and the Weasleys to gather around the kettle, verifies that they all know how to use a port key, which they have. So they do. And they all put their hand on some part of it. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore says he's going to give him a count to three, which I think further shows the power that Dumbledore has here because he set this port key to work when he wants it to. Yeah. Not like a, at a specific time, not like a... Whenever someone yeah. touches it, yeah. This is how he's just like, I have control over this. Yeah. So he has them all ready, says on the count of three, and as he's counting, he locks eyes with Harry, fucking finally. Right. And we see exactly why he's been trying to not do this. Because Harry immediately feels this foreign, unwanted, and horrifying to him surge of hatred and a desire to attack his headmaster yeah that's gotta freak him out yeah and it feels very similar to that snake like feeling Mm -hmm. that he experienced within his dream yeah but then dumbledore says three and he feels that jerk behind his navel and they disappear into that swirl of colors and wind and that's it it gets cut off why wouldn't it yeah The movie did this part quite a bit differently. However, it did get across a similar sentiment. Yeah, similar. For the movie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All things considered. (laughs) Harry gives communication another shot, but is once again cut off by Dumbledore telling another one of his painting buddies to swing by the Grimmy Gaff, as I like to call Grimmauld Place, as of right now, that is, (laughs) and let them also know that shit has gone down and they're about to be inundated by a gaggle of gingers this part is a dingish dingish sure did he say phineas i think he says phineas but we don't know we never had the part in grimald place where harry hears the painting talking yeah so harry has no idea who the fuck it is it's apparently not important apparently not even though it becomes important later in the books and never in the movies i don't think no they just never never include it no it's never really mentioned it's not even mentioned that he was a past headmaster. He just says, Phineas, go to Grimmauld Place and tell them all this shit's happening. And that was it. Yates. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, ding. Other- <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. But dingish. Sure. <laughs> it's more like a whisper of a ding. Yeah. The movie's just like, ding, guys. Ding. Psst. Ding. Ding. <laughs> 
It's like they showed it a picture of a bell. <laughs> and it's like they described a bell to it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but at this point, Harry is trying really hard, man. He is trying to keep his cool, but you can almost just hear the tea kettle in his head start to whistle. Everything's just building up and building up and building up. I think that's pretty accurate to the book, too. Yeah. At this point, the first painting returns and says, Good news, everyone! And he lets Dumbledore know that Artie Wheeze was found and he's going to be okay. And to make things better, Voldy didn't get the thing that he was trying to get. So, do you score? Yeah, and there was no mention in the book of something that Voldy was trying to get. No. And what's more, the Dark Lord failed to acquire it. Acquire what? Yeah. The fuck is going on? Hold on. That seems like maybe something you share when the room is not full of children. Exactly. Sir. But I guess they had to give us the information that Voldy was trying to get something somehow. I guess. Even though they already told us that earlier in the movie. They did, and now they're just, like, reiterating it for no damn reason. Well, just to let us know that he didn't get it. Well, Which, duh. So Dumbledore lets out a breath and goes back to doing his wise old mumble that no one understands, but the little teapot with the lightning bolt scar gets all steamed up and he starts to shout, Look at me, bitch! (laughs) I'm a little teapot (laughs) short and stuff. Here is my handle. Here is my spout. When I get all steamed up, here I shout, Look at me, bitch! (laughs) Exactly. Yes. You saw where I was going with that. (laughs) There's something wrong with us. So Dumbledore looks up at Harry in shock and is just like, holy shit, kid. Did you just write that whole song? Right? (laughs) Like, the fuck just happened? And Harry pants, but he lowers his voice, taking on just an almost pleading tone as he begs to be told what the actual fuck is happening to him. Yeah, that's definitely not how it happened in the book. No, we had no little teapot. I mean, we had Harry the little teapot, but he didn't steam up and shout. He just... He never boiled over. No. And it gets even worse, too, because at this moment, Snape, the king of timing that he is, enters the office. Why? Because we haven't seen Dumbledore do anything to summon Snape. No. (laughs) Whatever. He walks in and he looks from McGonagall to Harry and finally to Dumbledore before asking if he missed something because he's feeling a wee bit of tension in the room. Just a wee bit. Just a wee bit. Because, I mean, he probably like was in the hallway just as Harry's going, look at me. That'd be awkward to walk into, sure. But Dumbledore's just like, oh, thank shit, Sev. Like, I thought I was going to have to come clean for a hot second there. (laughs) Phew. (laughs) Whew. Dodge that bullet. Anyway, that thing that we talked about before, well, we need to start it tonight. Like, right this fucking second before we're all snake food. Yeah, that is definitely, definitely not how it happened in the book. I'm sorry, what? What, Dumbledore? Or we'll all be vulnerable. What, like, no, what, there's not... Nothing about this makes sense at this point of the movie. No. They jumped the gun on it so much And we also know that Snape was nowhere near this book chapter. (laughs) Uh, Snape does not come into play until later on. Yeah. It is not this chapter. It's definitely a thing that they did. A choice was made. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know. I get that they were trying to streamline things. This one did not work. I hate this part here. It just seemed like... So out of left field and just, why though? Yeah, and it's one of those things where even though it is the very next scene, Mm -hmm. it does not go with this book chapter. It barely goes with the next one. I would say, to say the least. So we're going to kind of skip what happens next and just cut off the movie section here. Yeah. Still some stuff to talk about for the rest of this first half of the book chapter. But we're going to jump forward to keep things lining up as much as possible and then come back to this when it actually happens in the book. Mm -hmm. Because this is not how it happens. How'd that go again? I don't think I can do that again. (laughs) (laughs) Secretly, I'm kind of glad. (laughs) (laughs) What actually happens is that when Harry's feet hit the ground again, it causes his knees to buckle and he falls to the floor. Sure. And he hears this voice commenting on the return of the blood traitors, wondering, 
wondering if it's true that their father is dying. And then he hears somebody else scream out. And he scrambles to his feet, finds them in the basement kitchen of Grimmel Place. Mm -hmm. As Creature is just slinking out the door because he just got yelled at. Yeah, but he did what he wanted to do. Oh, yeah. He achieved his goal. Yeah. Like, he got yelled at, but mission accomplished. Worth it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Anyway, Sirius is hurrying towards them. He wants to know what's going on because all he got from Phineas Nigellus was that Arthur's been injured and they're coming yeah. to stay. Yeah, that's going to raise some alarm bells for and sure. Sirius is just like, what the fuck, man? And Fred's just like, ask Harry. And George is like, yeah, ask Harry. I want to hear this too because they were not there to no. hear it like they had him in the movie. Mm-mm. So Harry retells his story. We don't have to go through it again. They didn't really do it in the book. The only thing they really mentioned is that he modified it a little bit so it didn't sound like he was the snake. I understand that, though, because it's one thing to tell Dumbledore the complete truth. It's another thing when you've got the children of the dude that you just attacked in a dream standing in front of you. Right. And in some ways, Harry is worried that he actually did it. Yeah. He felt like he was the snake. He kept thinking my fangs. He kept, he felt that hatred for Dumbledore. Yeah. So he's feeling kind of guilty as well. Mm hmm. But Ron already heard him say that he did it. So he shoots him this look like, mm, whatever, I'm going to let it go. Right. You do you, man. Like, you know what? There's a lot of shit going on yeah. right now. We'll let that one slide. We'll just keep it moving. So sure. Harry finishes the story and Fred now wants to know if their mom's there yet. And Sirius says Dumbledore's probably letting her know now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to take care of in something like this. So Ginny's just like, well, we need to get to St. Mungo's now and looks down at her night clothes. Can you lend us some cloaks? Yeah, because we didn't even have time to pack a bag or nothing. Like, yeah. And she's just like, we can't go to the hospital looking like this. And Sirius is just like, what do you, you can't go to the hospital at all. Yeah. And she's just like, what do you mean we can't go to the hospital? Our dad's been attacked. Like, we have to go see him. And he's just like, you can't go to the hospital before you're even supposed to know he's been attacked. They haven't even told his wife that he's there yet. He's probably still in triage for all we fucking know. Right? And George is just like, I don't see why that matters. Sirius is like, dude, you can't draw attention to the fact that Harry is having visions of things that are happening hundreds of miles away. We can't let the Ministry know that. Do you know how they use that against him? But the Weasley kids, aside from Ron, who kind of gets it a little bit better, I think. But the rest of them are just like, we don't care. Our dad might be dying. To be fair, that's an entirely understandable reaction. Oh, yeah. No, I totally understand. And I think Sirius ultimately does, too, because even though they kind of go back and forth with some arguing Mm -hmm. and Sirius is just like, yes, your dad is in danger, but they're trying to get this all sorted out. We cannot put what the order is trying to do in jeopardy. And George and Fred and Ginny are like, we don't care about the fucking order. It's our dad dying. And they even insult Sirius and say, it's easy for you to say all that when you're sitting here safely in your house. That's super awkward. Yeah. That's super awkward. But again, it's coming from a place of hurt and confusion. And fear. And fear, definitely. And again, Sirius understands that. Yeah, he does. He takes a deep breath. Even though he looks like he wants to throttle George. Again, understandable. Calms himself down and manages to say, we have to stay put until at least we hear from your mother. Yeah. Like, here's the thing. We can't let this go because if we let this go, your dad got hurt for nothing. Yeah. Our plans are out the window. This was all for fucking nothing. It sucks that this happened, but we gotta hold tight. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And Fred and George don't like this, but Ginny at least sits down in the nearest chair and Ron and Harry look at each other and they sit down too. And finally the twins are like, whatever, but they do it with a glare at Sirius. Of course. Yeah. We got to blame someone. Exactly. And I think that Harry feels like they're blaming him. I feel like Harry feels like that all the time. Well, yeah. (laughs) About everything. But it seems to me more like they don't blame Harry and that's just him being paranoid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's him. He blames him, I think. Yeah, at this point. He blames himself, so why wouldn't he think the Weasleys blame him? But now they're all sitting, and Sirius thinks that maybe they need something to drink and summon some butterbeer from the pantry, and they all just sit and drink their butterbeer and sit and drink their butterbeer. 
And Harry actually feels so sick in his stomach that he really doesn't even want to drink it. He just needs something for his hands to do. So he just keeps raising it to his mouth and setting it back down. And his brain is just like, was I the one who attacked Mr. Weasley? I wanted to attack Dumbledore. Was this me? Is it my fault? Are they blaming me? What's happening? A lot of shit's going on. A lot. And another burst of flame drops another gold feather, this time with a scroll of parchment. Mm-hmm. Sirius picks it up and says, that's not Dumbledore's handwriting, must be from your mom, hands it over to George, who immediately opens it up and reads, that is still alive. I'm setting out for St. Mungo's now. Stay where you are. I will send news as soon as I can. Mom. Nice and succinct. Yes. And they're all like, dad is still alive. Like, it makes it sound like he's hovering somewhere between life and death. Yeah, they're filling in the words for now. Yeah. To the end of that, for sure. So they have nothing to say to this. Like, this isn't a relief to them. Now they're just like, great, now we wait. Mm -hmm. And they just sit in silence. And Sirius is just like, maybe you should try going back to bed. And they all just look at him like, what? (laughs) He's just like, no big deal. Just just stay where you are. It's fine. Or y'all can hang out here. That's cool. That's good. Yeah, yeah, it was a very half-hearted suggestion. He oh, yeah. was not expecting them to actually go to bed. He was just like, something to pass time? Yeah. <laughs> and they all just kind of settle in in the kitchen for pretty much the longest fucking night ever. Yeah. And that is where we're going to end this half of the book chapter. Yeah, and since the movie scene was so odd and we didn't really have any new characters, like we had the portraits, but we didn't see them. Yeah, really. not like, really. There was really nothing to him. Yeah, I'm going to go with there's no new actors to talk about. Yeah. Yay, portraits. I, Yay. Sure. But that'll bring us to this week's Potter Pondering, which is, what do you think that silver instrument with the pale green smoke that Dumbledore used was and was telling him? And bonus points if you also want to make up the story that McGonagall gave to Pepto Bitch Mall. Right? I want to hear that, guys. I really do. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer and get it to us the Wednesday before so I have time to get it into the next episode. If you don't make that deadline, don't forget you can also stitch your response on TikTok or just comment it on our social media. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from Val Brown. Yay! She writes, I'm a Slytherin. My Patronus is a tortoiseshell cat, and my wand is chestnut, 13 and a quarter inches, with a dragon heartstring core, hard flexibility. My muggle job is a middle school Spanish teacher. For my ninth birthday, my aunt and uncle gave me a copy of Prisoner of Azkaban. They heard Harry Potter was pretty popular with kids, but not anything else, so they bought me Azkaban thinking the books could be read in any order. After a little bit of research, we figured it out, and I was soon the proud owner of the first three all at once. I read them so fast there was true heartbreak when I got to the end of Azkaban and there was nothing left. I pre-ordered Goblet of Fire from a kind of obscure FYE type store in the mall, and called every hour on release day to see if their stupid slow shipment had come in yet. All my friends were into it, and it was just so much fun to talk about. We loved the movies just as much. Every time a new book would be released, I'd reread the whole series again in anticipation. Every time the movies were on ABC Family, that's what I was doing all weekend. I cried through a good portion of both book and movie 7, Just realizing how beautifully JKR tied all of these things together from years past. When I was first sorted into Slytherin, I was honestly a little disappointed. I always saw myself as a Ravenclaw because I love a good witty comeback and was always proud of doing well in school. But through Pottermore slash Wizarding World, I have realized I am definitely Team Green. Witty comebacks, statement hair, not much of a hugger, and well-crafted CV are all boxes checked on my Slytherin bingo. I love the self-care for Slytherins you posted because it really does speak to my soul. I'm so happy to know you guys and get invited to witness and be part of your trivia domination, very rarely contributing by identifying a photo of Colin Creevy, making eye contact while writing Harry Potter pickup lines or similar. I thought I was good, but you guys are killing it. Can't wait to hear more of your thoughts. Aww. <sighs> Val was one of our original Harry Potter trivia team members. Oh, yeah. She was one of our OGs. So hot. Want Want to to touch touch Hermione? Ow! (laughs) 
And then hit it in Quidditch. Hit it in Quidditch. And D's Canucks. <laughs> and she came up with our wonderful yeah. Harry Potter pickup line. If you suck D's Canucks, I'll make your canary cream. Facts. We got bonus <laughs> points for that. We did. Thank you so much for your trivia team support, your very clever and witty comebacks slash pickup lines, mm-hmm. and for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Val. And for just being you. Thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, what is on the second floor at St. Mungo's? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag healers, not doctors, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated, even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 22, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, and a disappointing lack of corresponding film scenes. Wah, wah. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calming Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake.